Um, can I ask about your cyber background and education? Are you like a computer science guy? Mm, more like enthusiast. <laughs> okay. That you, you love computers. Yes. And, and do you have a military background? Mm, sort of. What does that mean? Um, it's not the questions that I can answer you fully because uh, it may uh, lead to a better understanding what kind of person I am. We agreed to keep his identity a secret because first, he's talking to us from Kiev, and second, because he's part of a resistance movement there. But he's not a member of those territorial defense forces beating back the Russian advance on the ground. The person we're talking to, we'll call him admin, has older parents, so he said he couldn't go to the front. I need to stay closer to my family to support them. It's my uh, duty as a man, as a human being, to be closer to them, to protect them and to help them. So instead, he decided to do something a little different. He began working with a cyber force. Admin is one of eight administrators trying to organize volunteers helping Ukraine fight Russia in cyberspace. They're a diverse group of IT and cybersecurity professionals from all around the world. They call themselves the Ukrainian IT Army. And well, as a general matter, they aren't the kind of skillful hackers that take down a power grid or blow up rockets on the launch pad. They're very good at being irritating, really irritating. According to Checkpoint Software Technologies, which has been tracking all of this, the IT army has been posting anti-war messages on Russian media outlets, leaking data, and taking aim at government and military servers. And what makes all this different is that for the first time in history, just about anyone can join the fight, right where they are, just for the asking. I'm Dina Temple Raston, and this is Click Here, a podcast about all things cyber and intelligence. Today, we meet the rank and file of one of the most unusual cyber forces ever assembled. Stay with us. I'm Jacob Goldstein. I used to host Planet Money. Now I'm starting a new show. It's called What's Your Problem? Every week on What's Your Problem, entrepreneurs and engineers describe the future they're going to build once they solve a few problems. I'm talking to people trying to figure out how to do things that no one on the planet knows how to do, from creating a drone delivery business to building a car that can truly drive itself. Listen to What's Your Problem on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. I joined uh, volunteers on the first day of invasion because I wanted to help people, uh, but I needed to stay with my family. This is one of the administrators for the IT army again. We're calling him admin. I joined uh, um, a few different groups, and uh, one of them invited me to join uh, an IT army. I'm sure there are a lot of people like you who want to do something to help, who maybe their best skill is not you know, grabbing a rifle, but instead grabbing a keyboard? Um, yes, we, uh, we are deciding what uh, type of targets to attack, what should we do next, uh, how to organize people in a better way so we can um, achieve our goals faster and easier. Using Telegram, they developed bots to block Russian news sites. They've created a system to log and report Russian troop movements. There's even online lessons on how to make Molotov cocktails. And you could say that Admin has developed a specialty. He focuses on misinformation. It's important to, to shut down uh, some of the main information platforms to the Russian people where they actually receive news. Uh, one of the target types for us is uh, online news sites, but I'll stay quiet about the details. The early volunteers for this IT brigade were thousands of hackers and IT professionals around Ukraine. Then, as the fighting grew more fierce on the ground, something shifted. The IT army became a global swarm. And the pylon didn't just include Ukrainian cybersecurity officials. 
Hacktivists from around the world started showing up and asking what they could do to help. People like Squad 303, a group of programmers from Poland who managed to get their hands on nearly 200 million Russian cell phone numbers and email addresses. They built a site that allows anyone in the world to message any of those numbers and then tell them the truth about the war. Then hacktivist collective Anonymous stepped up. And we, we saw the propaganda and the disinformation and we, we just decided, like, something needs to be done about this. This is Discordian. He's a kind of spokesperson for Anonymous. And we started talking amongst ourselves and being like, hey, can we turn this into an operation? It was like day one of the invasion, and uh, you seen this Belarusian arms manufacturer being hacked. And, uh, you know, there's training manuals, there's trade secrets, and those are the same kind of weapons that are now at this moment being used to bomb Ukraine. So Anonymous released those training manuals. And they had other little projects. Russia Today was taken offline for multiple, multiple days during the initial attack. Um, You mean the news channel? Yeah, the news channel, yes. It it was unreachable for days uh, because of Anonymous, because they also engage in a lot of this disinformation that we see out there. For example, uh, this information that Ukrainians would just accept the soldiers coming into their country and they would be happy because they also speak Russian, which is a completely weird reason to accept an invasion, right? Oh, you, you speak Russian, we speak Russian, you're welcome here. No, you're invading my country, get the fuck out. So yeah, it's, it's kind of like going against that narrative is also very important to us. They've hacked into Russian websites and posted casualty numbers. They've provided photographs. And then they had this other particularly inspired little gem. There was this operation to write Google reviews in Russian restaurants to, to, uh, to, to say what is going on there to get around censors. Um, Anonymous is very creative. Hackers making mischief is old news. What's different this time is that the people who responded to this global call-out are cybersecurity professionals. The people who you call to say that someone is trying to get into your system, or the people who tell you your administrator credentials have been compromised. These are the people who are actually on the other side of the hack. And this call to arms, or call to hack, has put the concept of wartime cyber operations into an entirely new light. And no one is quite sure how to define it. Government officials usually see this collective action in cyberspace as a kind of hooliganism. But in this case, it's war. We have a martial law here in Ukraine. And uh, I don't think that uh, uh, appealing to moral principles works, since our enemy doesn't have any principles. That's Viktor Zura. He's one of Ukraine's top cybersecurity officials. And he's speaking here in one of his weekly press conferences. He made clear that Ukraine had to fight fire with fire in cyberspace. They're killing innocent people, children, women. They're firing hospitals and nuclear plants, bringing threats to the whole world. Enter the IT army. While we can't verify how big it really is, Zura told us it's... Probably up to half a million cybersecurity professionals, of uh, IT professionals, of students... uh, and uh, a lot of volunteers from, uh, uh, from other countries. If there's any one person who knows what the IT army is doing, it's Zura. That's because he runs what is essentially the Ukrainian equivalent of America's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. His job, like CISA's, is to protect Ukraine's key computer networks. And he saw the invasion coming before it actually happened. On 23rd of February, uh, and in the second half of the day, we had a number of uh, huge cyber attacks. And I felt that uh, there could be a sign of uh, uh, invasion. Uh, I decided to, to get prepared. He has spent most of the war in a cyber bunker of sorts, a command and control center, trying to ensure that Ukraine's infrastructure and communication centers stay up and running, which is no small task. 
uh, Ukraine witnessed the most uh, destructive uh, cyber attacks uh, in the history over the last eight years. Uh, and uh, we, were, we were working hard on uh, strengthening our uh, cybersecurity infrastructure for, for the last one or two years. I suppose we were well prepared for this uh, cyber war. Well prepared for war for a few reasons. Ukraine has been a test bed for Russian cyber attacks for years. Russians hacked Ukraine's elections commission. They shut down websites. The Russian group known as Sandworm turned out the lights in Kyiv for hours, just because they could. Dark. Russia appears to have figured out how to crash a power grid with a click. And the attacks kept getting worse. The cyber weapon Not Petya started in Ukraine in June of 2017. It quickly spread, paralyzing major companies and causing more than $10 billion in damage. Ukraine responded by building a more resilient system. It has thousands of internet service providers. Take down one, they have a dozen more waiting to take their place. They have a network of cybersecurity companies and partners who have spent years preparing just for this kind of Russian onslaught. Case in point, the U.S. sent cyber teams to Ukraine months ago to help them shore up their systems and clean out any malware our nation state hackers might have secretly planted. All this was done very quietly which has led some analysts to believe that Russia may have planned a bigger cyber component to open the war, only to find out its entree into Ukraine's systems had vanished. This is Click Here. When we come back, the problem with creating a cyber army on the fly. Hi, I'm Mike Pesca, host of the GIST podcast. Every day I bring you news you may not have thought about in a certain light. I do a spiel. Think of it as an op-ed, but usually more fun. You might hear something like this. Uh, yes. Actually, that was recent guest Al Franken from an interview. We have an interview every day. Here's another clip that you're definitely going to ponder the context of. A love between an animal and human doesn't mean intercourse. That was Ralph Nader, and who can disagree? The gist, unexpected, but constructive, every day where you get your podcasts. Could you just give us your name and what you do? Well, let's just go with Yanni for now. Yanni. And okay. um, obviously, I can't tell you too much about what I do. Um, Let's just say that I'm an IT professional and uh, I'm trained in cybersecurity. Where do you live? In Finland. And that's Finland. that's all I'm going to give for now. Yanni did reveal to us that he works in the cybersecurity industry and felt compelled to act. Basically, once I started hearing about civilians and children and uh, women and elderly getting uh, bombed or killed or starved, is when I basically decided that I have to do something. So when he got an invite on Telegram to join the IT army, he jumped on it. What was the sign-up process like, or was there one? There wasn't any. That's, the, that's one of the big problems here, actually. Basically, anybody can join in and start doing whatever. So that's one issue. No vetting. Another, which is a perennial hacker problem, is good old-fashioned bravado. Some members of the IT army are trying to show off, and they don't know what they don't know, which could have some unexpected consequences. When you do something, like try these things on, an, on a scale like this, you don't have chances for mistakes, basically. The kinds of mistakes made mostly by amateurs. So the term in the U.S., I don't know if this is a term in Finland too, is script kiddies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, script kiddy is somebody who pretends to be really good at hacking and that sort of thing, but in fact copies a lot of code from other people and tries to pass it off on their own. So they're sort of amateurs trying to look like professionals. Yeah, exactly. You know this term? Yep. And do you, do you get the sense that there are a lot of script kiddies out there? Yeah, the majority are, unfortunately. I mean, it, it's almost like um, 
you know, in, in the Ukraine, they're handing guns to everyone. And a lot of them probably don't know how to shoot them. Yeah. Is it the same sort of thing? Pretty much. Pretty much. That's not to detract from the IT Army's efforts. It's just a fact. Admin, who helps organize some of these operations, says so himself. And that's part of the reason he took on the administrative role. He's good at organizing people, not hacking. But this gets back to the IT Army's strength, which we mentioned before, being irritating. That might not sound like much, but because of its sheer scale, the IT Army's attacks are forcing Russian nation-state hackers to play defense, and that eats into the time they would otherwise spend hacking Ukraine. That's the upside. The downside is that volunteer computer enthusiasts and professionals are doing anything they can think of to support the cause. And that sort of freewheeling, massive operation, almost by definition, has coordination problems. I was actually trying try to get into this one um, file server that um, got actually DDoSed down. DDoS, Distributed Denial of Service. Basically, it crashes a server. And I didn't have time to get in there. When, when I actually had an administrator like screen open in front of me and I was trying to brute force it and everything. But then people went, went and took it down. So in other words, Yanni was about to break into a network and then the IT army, which had no idea what he was up to, took down the server he was about to hack. And that sort of thing could affect more than just people like Yanni. A former military official involved in cyber issues told me that the IT army may unwittingly derail secret U.S. Cybercom and NSA operations, too. We asked Cybercom and the National Security Council about that, and they didn't respond to our request for comment. This is Click Here. Here are some of the important cyber and intelligence headlines this week. President Joe Biden signed legislation that requires critical infrastructure companies to report any breaches or ransomware attacks. The Strengthening American Cybersecurity Act requires operators to alert CISA within 72 hours of a breach and 24 hours after a ransomware payment. It also grants CISA the power to subpoena entities that don't report a cyber incident or ransomware payment. CISA has up to two years to publish a notice in the Federal Register on how it intends to implement the reporting requirements. The Biden administration intends to review the NSA Cybercom dual-hat leadership structure. This has been a subject of perennial discussion. Some think the job is too big for one person. Others say that having it under one command helps with coordination. Ronald Moultrie, the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, told a House Armed Services Committee panel that the Biden administration would take another look at the way NSA and Cybercom are organized. The two agencies have had a shared leadership since the Defense Department created Cybercom in 2009. U.S. and international satellite communication network providers and customers may be targets of hacks in the wake of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. On February 24th, a Viasat satellite was disabled, shutting off modems of tens of thousands of European customers. It also disrupted Ukrainian military and police units, posing a serious threat to the country as it fended off invading Russian troops. Russia suspected of being behind the operation. And in a press conference on Monday, Biden administration officials said they had developed new intelligence that suggests Russia is exploring how to respond to global sanctions with cyber attacks. Today's episode was produced by Sean Powers and Will Jarvis, and it was edited by Steve Lichtai, with fact-checking by Darren Ancrum. Ben Levingston composed our theme and original music for the episode. We had additional music from Blue Dot Sessions. Click Here is a production of The Record Media, and we want to hear from you. Please leave us a review and rating wherever you get your podcasts, and you can connect with us at clickhereshow.com. I'm Dina Temple Rustin. We'll be back on Tuesday.
I'm Adam Janowski, Editorial Director at The Record by Recorded Future, one of the leading cybersecurity news outlets in the world. So cybersecurity is an incredibly complex topic. You've probably heard about different scams, hacks. It's more important than ever to have a source of news that can demystify these complex worlds and help you stay secure. Each month, uh, we have hundreds of thousands of people that turn to us to learn about the latest in cybersecurity, to listen to deep dive podcast episodes about cyber criminals and hackers, and uh, just catch up on the latest news from the worlds of cybersecurity and intelligence. If you want to know more about the stories that you're hearing on the podcast or that you're reading on the record.media, you can subscribe to our newsletter where we dive into the latest cybersecurity news and analysis every day.